Uh, is that okay? Can I start then? Yeah. Great, perfect. Well, good evening, everybody, and praise the Lord to um, be able to talk to him. It's an absolute privilege, isn't it, to speak to God Almighty and to know that when we've done so, we have left in the court of heaven uh, those petitions, those needs, maybe something very urgent, very pressing, very profound, some personal, some concerning families and nations even. And what a difference it makes when heaven responds with mighty power and interventions. And we just ask the Lord now, Lord, we do thank you for the privilege of speaking to you. We thank you, Lord, that we are certainly in your presence, that you're with us. We thank you for your holy word. And we, as we look at it, Lord, we would hear from you very clearly. So we commit everything tonight to you in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So I want to look at um, Revelation 22, the last chapter in the Bible. And I want to look at one verse, um, which I think you will all know pretty well. And it's a, it's a wonderful, sorry, it's, on, it's, on, it's verse um, 17. And it's a wonderful invitation. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that heareth say, come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. What an extraordinary thing that is, you know, that the, the spirit of God, and, and what is this great being? Obviously, part of the trinity of god the triune god we know that the, that uh, god is revealed in his word and it accords with truth and it actually we know instinctively about this that it is absolutely right there's the father the son and the holy spirit we know that each of them is different each of them is the same and belong in a unified being and we can't we don't understand it but it is plainly true and when you think of the different aspects of the character of God's spirit, and we can't always know too much, but we know what the scriptures tell us. I mean, for example, when the Lord Jesus Christ was baptized, the heavens opened and the spirit of God came down, descended upon him like a dove. And you get that lovely gentleness of the spirit. Remember when Elijah, I don't want to go there right now, but when Elijah runs away from Jezebel after he has done so well, I mean, he's prayed and he got through and he shut heaven so there's no rain. And then he, after many years, three and a half years, um, and Ahab has looked everywhere for him in all the local, neighboring kingdoms and so on. And then he has that showdown with the prophets of Baal. And at the very end of the day, having poured all the water on the sacrifice, he calls and God sends down fire. And then he um, prays and prays and prays and the, the, the little cloud appears. And then he says to him, you better run, it's going to pour. And it pours with rain. And the next day, Jezebel says, you will be as dead as my prophets this time tomorrow. And he goes from her, he flees from her, really. And goes to the Mount of God, and, and he, there's an earthquake, there's wind and fire, but the Lord is not in that. The Lord speaks in a still, small voice. And it's so often the case, isn't it, that when we really hear from the Lord, it's quiet, it's still, it's gentle. Um, and the Lord, it was the Spirit of God that moved upon the waters, is that great creating force. And then you get that fire. And I just want to look briefly at Matthew 3 because. Again, scriptures we know, but they, they carry such a power to them. I'm in verse 11, of course, and this is John the Baptist speaking, that I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. And that was a very significant ministry. The Lord says of him that he was a burning and a shining light and you were for a season willing to rejoice in that light. He adds to for the fulfillment of prophecy that this is Elijah, which was for to come. Because there's no reincarnation. He wasn't Elijah reincarnated. Obviously, every human soul is different to every other human soul and an individual made by God. But he was in the spirit and power 
of Elijah. Uh, but he says, I baptize you under repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He should baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. The two things, the fire of God's spirit, the fire of conviction, when that conviction comes, when souls are before him, absolutely terrified suddenly an encounter with eternity with the being of god the holiness of god the terror of the lord the dreadfulness of sin the guilt that rests upon us and then with that the revelation that comes by the spirit of god is the he will convince the world of sin righteousness and judgment and what a thrilling thing it is what a wonderful privilege it is to have been um, subject to those processes which the Spirit of God gives. Sin, righteousness, judgment, and the certainty of the truth of God's word. And, and uh, yet here, in the, in the scripture that we, we looked at, um, he is asking, inviting, one other verse, I, well, I'll just mention it, you know it, but the the Spirit of God, with that, that passionate intercession um, that uh, I'm just mentioning, going back to Revelation 22, but that passionate intercession, we're told, aren't we, in Romans, that the Spirit, that we don't know, oftentimes we don't even know what we need. We don't even know how to pray. But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered there's a power in that verse it's really it's quite a shocking verse to me anyway that um for us christians as individuals there's an interest in our spiritual survival prosperity removal of danger from us advancement into the things of god the purposes of god that the god the only god spirit really understands and which he sees with of immense importance and, and which attract from him a passion of prayer for us so here you get you know aspects of the spirit of god but here what is he doing he is inviting he says come what a gracious thing that is and look at the rest of this book we can't obviously go into it now but oh my goodness the things in the book of revelation the church is a mess they're in the rebellion of humanity the coming down of satan and his host and the worship of the beast the, the mark of the beast the battles the loveliness of the bride and so on we might look at that in a minute but the um then at the end of all that there's this gentle loving invitation come just come and the bride obviously we know that that is obviously without any doubt the the true church of god and i say that with a real emphasis i i'm more and more than ever conscious of it you know that there is a there's a true church of god and and um you know the the um parable of the dragnet the which is concerns the visible church i mean the, the parable of the wheat and tares that's the world the, the lord says that the work of the field is the world but the dragnet is you know i will make you fishers of men the images stay the same and it, it it gets in all kinds of fishes at the end they're separated but on that journey there's all kinds of people apparently in the church many not really in the church but those who really belong to the Lord, they are, they are, they, they are engaged in great things. But this is an element, isn't it, always in the life of any church, to make the offer to the lost, the offer to them. It's an offer, it's a simple offer. Just come, says that holy bride. And and pass it on, he that heareth. You know, if you even if you know enough to tell others, well, do that. Um, 
but undoubtedly this is the church and you know you get the if you go back to um, chapter 19 of revelation you see her really in her glory um the end of the work done i'm sorry it's verse seven and um um yeah verses seven eight and nine let's be glad and give honor to him the marriage of the lamb is come she's a bride his wife has made herself ready and to her was granted she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white the fine linen is the righteousness of saints he says unto me right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and he said to me these are the true sayings of God. There's not a shadow of doubt that all of this is absolute truth. And it's so important to us. It means to make ourselves ready to be part of that precious bride. And you know that, so we go to 2 Corinthians 11, please. That 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 uh, chastity, that holiness, that refusal to be defiled is always attacked. It's always attacked. Uh, Satan de is determined to spoil the bride of Christ. And the way that he puts it, the way that Paul puts this to the Corinthian church, and I, verse two, I'm, I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. I've espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And, you know, wicked men, imagine that, and this has happened enough times in this world, hasn't it? The, the way they will spoil a virgin so she's never she will lose something that she that ought to be there on her wedding day and it's gone and it's an image which paul sees and links to the um subverting of eve in the garden you know it, the serpent is subtle he is subtle and he questions god in a clever way and he you might say, well, that's a, that is a very extreme view. Is that what the Bible really teaches? Could God be like that? You know, all kinds of little subtle suggestions. And then there's something in us which if we haven't, if we haven't been pretty ruthless with ourselves, there's something in us that can just latch on to that, maybe even wants it, you know? And, and the danger. Um, and that bride... She'll never be able to invite people, not really, unless she is herself pure. And the danger that Paul presents, it is actually quite, uh, to me, it's quite amazing because they are a really good church and they're real. When Paul first arrives in Corinth, the Lord says to him, Look, don't be afraid to speak. No one's going to hurt you here because he'd have been so many floggings and stonings and the Lord knows what he'd been through. He says, I have much people in this city. Those Christians, they were God's children. I don't think they had lots of trouble with them, but but how could it be that somebody with a different Jesus, a different spirit, a different gospel might well be born with? They ought to be anything like that. They immediately evict that man. Who are you to say these things? There's a danger. And I, I'm just trying to give this point that there is, you know, that that need for absolute purity. You know, to go back, if we could go back, please, to Revelation 22, the absolute purity, if we're going to be that bride that invites, that says to the world, that says to the lost soul, come, come to Jesus. Jesus is waiting for you. And um, that invitation to the lost, and, and it is so important. I remember John Wesley, my great hero, but he said to his preachers, you have no business on earth except to save souls. That's it, to invite the lost. And I like the qualification, all that's needed is thirst. You've got to, all, that, all that God wants of you is that you really want him, that you are thirsty for him, that you long for Christ Jesus. And that's enough to qualify you to drink of that wonderful water, the water of life, and it's free. We, of course, know exactly why it's free, because they're, there was a price paid by the Son of God that is, well, it's, it can't be measured. It can't be comprehended. I'm not sure if we'll ever really understand it. What he did to make this salvation 
this living water a free gift and it's free to the wickedest, wickedest man on earth that's the wonder of the gospel that's the wonder of the cross and the closer you get to god the more conscious you are of that and i remember thomas walsh and i um a very holy man and thousands are in heaven because of that man irishman died at the age of 28 but said it is the blood of christ and not my holiness or my usefulness that it, that allows my that provides my acceptance acceptance with the holy god and my final justification blood of christ alone that's why this invitation even to the most wicked man is real it's free and it, and if you know this well tell others he that heareth will pass it on and and look for those who are thirsty and it, I mean, it is to be all consumed and i just one last thought really um i think it's relevant look at the hebrews 10 please um what so what will that accepting that invitation say yeah i'm i'm hearing you holy ghost through church i'm hearing you i will come to christ i do want to drink of that living water but there and i want to go to verse sorry verse 16 but there is something that that, that is there's a process there's a there's a fitness through the blood of jesus through the new covenant and he says this verse 16 this is the covenant i will make them after those days says that i will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will i write them and their sins and iniquities will i remember no more that will qualify them to drink that living water now, where remission of these is, there's no more offering for sin. Having, therefore, brethren, boldness. I've had that word lately, partly from our work verse for the year, you know, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. But having, therefore, brethren, boldness, a boldness which, which comes only because we know what Christ has done for us, not because we, have, we deserve anything, or that God would respond to our being ambitious and brave and demanding of course not that boldness is is on a good foundation it's it's a boldness which we have because christ has done it for us but we need to do that to enter into the holiest by the blood of jesus by a new and living way which is consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having a high priest over the house of god uh, if we just move on to the next, I want to go to verse 25. Um, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. The invitation, it's not, it doesn't say come through any door, come in any way that's different to the gospel way. Of course it doesn't say that. But it's saying if you're thirsty, it's right there for you. Christ is right there for you. And so let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching there's a there are there are different aspects to this coming to the lord responding to the invitation to come and it, it includes these things you, if you are uh, a lost soul hearing the spirit and the bride say come you will very soon be part of that bride if this is a real thing and you will be gathering and it's a dangerous thing, isn't it? I'm, you know, we so frequently find people don't bother to get to the meetings or whatever it might be and not conscious of the ramifications for that, you know. Because especially as we see the day approaching, so that glorious invitation, the Spirit and the Bride say, come, let him that hears say, come, let him that is a thirst come, take the water of life freely. Thank you.